timely technologists and punctual Pythonistas, it's Prof G, and in this lesson we're going to update our Raspberry Pi Pico W's by getting time over the internet. And we'll use CircuitPython to parse out the JSON formatted data and get it into a readable time set for a given time zone. We'll also learn how to format dates and times, and we'll schedule functions so that they run at specific times and intervals. Let's synchronize our watches for big learning. Now at the end of our last lesson, we got this data from the World Time API website and we downloaded it to our Pico W. Now if you haven't completed that lesson, you probably want to go back and start there because we're going to be using code that we wrote by the end of that lesson. Now this is what the data looks like. We need to do two things. We need to parse or filter out the specific data that we need to tell time and we need to convert that data to get the current time. Now the data that we're looking at is organized in a format called JSON, J-S-O-N. That stands for JavaScript Object Notation. That really has nothing to do with JavaScript. It's just a very common way of organizing data in what are called key value pairs. Now the keys are the names or labels of the data. And all of these are strings, abbreviation, client IP, date time, all the way through week number, those are all keys. And the value for each key comes after the colon. And we see that these are different data types. Some values are strings, some are numbers, some say no, which means there's no data being stored. And this website returns pretty simple JSON. But in the future, we'll see that some websites have keys that return additional key value pairs so that JSON is nested, or they can also return lists of data. Now there are two bits of data that we wanna get inside the data that was returned. This number here for the key Unix time, and this other number here for the key raw underscore offset. Now Unix time is a common way that computers keep time. It's the number of seconds that have elapsed since midnight, January 1st, 1970. Sounds weird, but computers love telling time that way. And time offset is the time difference between Greenwich Mean Time, that's the universal time standard, and my location, which is five hours behind Greenwich Mean Time in Boston in the United States. So 18,000 is 18,000 seconds or five hours, and the minus is because Greenwich is five hours ahead of where I am. So first, let's discuss how we can parse out the values for the keys, Unix time, and time underscore offset from the data that we've already received. So at the end of the last lesson, we made our API call using requests.get, and we passed in the URL that will give us back the time data that we saw on the earlier page. Now in the code that we wrote in the prior lesson, we printed out response.txt. Now when we return to that code to update it, delete or comment out that line. We can't use response.txt and then get response.json, which is what we wanna do in the next command. So this command, response.json, is a method that gets the data formatted as parsable JSON, and we're putting that into a variable that we call JSON. Then to get the individual values from the JSON, we just refer to the JSON variable, followed by square brackets, passing in between the brackets the string of the key that's associated with the value that we want. So here we get Unix time and raw underscore offset, and we put them into variables with the same name. Now it's absolutely critical that you use the same key name with the same case and spelling that you see in the key name on the JSON on the website, otherwise your code will not work. Then I'm gonna create a variable called location underscore time, and that's just gonna be the number Unix time, which is the time in seconds since the first second of 1970, plus the raw offset, which is the time difference in seconds between the location that I accessed, for me that's New York, and Greenwich Mean Time, which is currently five hours ahead of me. Hence, I'm negative 18,000, which is minus five hours from Greenwich Mean Time. Now, if you're accessing a different time zone, and obviously you're accessing during a different time, you're gonna see different values in here. So now we have the current time in seconds, let's format this into something usable. So by calling the time library's local underscore time method and passing in our time in seconds, that's what location underscore time is, this is gonna break apart the time in a bunch of usable components. And by printing the current time, we'll see it here. These are all the different components. TM underscore year is the year, TM underscore mun is month, TM underscore M day for the date day of the month, TM hour, we've got TM min for minutes, etc. But it would be nice if we could print this out to the console in a more readable format, and we can do that with this line here. By referring to the variable current underscore time, then following this with a dot and then the component name, like a dot TM underscore hour here or dot TM underscore min here, we access the value in that component. So the format string has the variable name that I wanna use, followed by a colon, and then I've got a string for format specifier. So the D here converts this value to a number, but since I have no period in here, there won't be any decimals. Now in this set of curly braces over here, I convert current underscore times TM min property, but the colon 02D here says, make sure there are two digits in this, and if there's only one digit, use a leading zero out front. 
So if the minute is just seven, it'll print as zero seven. But if it's a two digit minute like 12, it'll print out one two. I've done the same thing for TM underscore sec here, the seconds property of current time. This is all on one line, but my font's too big, so it wrapped it onto two lines. So I've created these as two formatted strings. I print them out down here, and our purple friends Prince and Blinka should be very happy with this. And now that we have the time, we'll use it to set the internal clock, which is called an RTC for real time clock, on the Raspberry Pi Pico W. So to do this, we'll import the RTC library, then we'll use it to create an object of class type, RTC, we're gonna call ours clock, and then to set the clock, we simply set the date time property of our clock object using the time library's struct underscore time method, and we'll pass in the structured time data that we have in our current underscore time value, and use that to set the clock with the proper time. So now that we have our Pico W with an internally set clock, let's schedule some jobs or functions to run at specific times. Now first I'm going to import the library CircuitPython underscore schedule as schedule. Now we haven't yet installed this library on our boards. It's not part of the Adafruit underscore CircuitPython library bundle that we downloaded and used earlier. This is in the community bundle. That contains additional libraries that are created and supported by the CircuitPython open source community, but outside of Adafruit. This still works great. I'll show you where we can find and install the library before we code things up, but assuming this has been installed, we can import it with this statement here, which lets us refer to the library as schedule. Then I'll define a function that I want to run at a scheduled time. I'm going to call this function job, but you could call it whatever you want, and it simply prints the string a scheduled job has run, and it takes the clock's hour, minute, and second properties, and it formats them with colons in between, so it's an easy to read time, and it puts them in a variable called printable time, and we print it out here. Now I could do anything in this function, or I could create other functions with different names and schedule them. So if I wanted to do something like turn on a light at a particular time or run a motor or play a sound, I could create functions to do all of those things. Then to schedule the function to run the job, we use the schedule library we imported up here. And there are lots of ways to schedule things. Here are two examples. This line here says schedule so that every five seconds do, meaning run, the function in parens, which is the job function. So every five seconds, we should print out a scheduled job has run along with the current time. Below this, I schedule a function called get underscore time and we run that every day at midnight again we've got to use 24 hour time so we'll put our code to access the internet that gets the JSON and updates the time in a function that we'll call get time. And this is a good thing to run because it'll make sure that the time on our Pico is in sync with the correct time, which is on the internet. That's important because the RTC and the Pico can drift over time and syncing it up with the internet should keep things timely. Then we want to make sure that we call the schedules dot run underscore pending method in our while true loop. So every time we hit this, our Pico will check to see if we have any jobs that are scheduled that should be run. And if so, it'll run them. So let's code this up and see how it works. Now, first, as mentioned, we need to get the CircuitPython underscore schedule library from the community bundle. So I'll open a browser and head to circuitpython.org and click on the libraries tab. Now, previously we downloaded from the bundles area, but if you continue to scroll down, you'll see an area labeled community bundle. And you can see that these libraries are written and supported by community members. So if you want to contribute to CircuitPython by writing a library, you can submit your work to be added here. Now, as I'm recording this lesson, I'm using CircuitPython 8, but if you have a higher version, make sure you choose the bundle number for that version. But I'm gonna click and download Community Bundle version 8, and I'll save that to my desktop and minimize my browser and open the folder I just downloaded and head to the LIB folder. And I can find CircuitPython underscore schedule in here. This is the library I need. So with my board plugged in, I'm gonna go into my CircuitPy volume and I no longer need this alarm sound folder. So to make sure that I've got enough space, I'm gonna delete this folder and you can delete any other sounds that you have in here too. And then I'm just gonna drag circuit Python underscore schedule from the community bundle into my LIB folder on CircuitPy. Make sure it goes in the LIB folder, not outside it, otherwise your code won't work. I've seen students make that mistake and I've made that mistake myself sometimes. So there it is inside the LIB with my other libraries. I can close my community bundle on my desktop. And while I'm here, just so that I have a backup of the latest copy of my CircuitPy files in case I lose files or I need to reinstall them, I'm gonna create a new folder on my desktop called Pico W Backup. And I'll grab all the files and folders on my Pico and I'll drag them into this folder on my computer. Now I actually didn't need boot out.txt since that's created by CircuitPython and I'll make different copies of my code.py later too, but I've got the latest version of my LIB folder that I've created nicely backed up. So now let's head to Moo and write our scheduling code. So this is the code that we'd written by the end of the prior lesson. And if you don't have this code, you can complete that lesson first, then come back here. Now I'm gonna change the comment here to internet time, comma RTC, comma scheduled jobs. 
and we need to import new libraries. So I'm going to import RTC comma and circuit Python underscore schedule as schedule. Then we'll set up the real time clock and we'll call this clock and we'll set that equal to RTC dot and in all caps RTC open and close parens. Then I'm going to break out the code that I want to repeat so that I can get the time multiple times into a separate function that I'm going to call get underscore time. So all the stuff that I have up here where I connect to Wi-Fi and I set up the URL, I only need to do that once. But after I set up the URL, this is where my get time function is going to start. So I'll say def space get underscore time open and close parens colon. Then I'll highlight all the lines below this and I'll press tab and that'll indent them. Now remember, I also said that we want to get rid of this line that says response.txt, because if we have that in there and we also try to use response.json, we're going to get an error. So I'm just going to delete this third line, and I'm going to replace it with code to convert response into JSON. So we'll call the variable to hold JSON, JSON, J-S-O-N, equals response.json, open and close parens. So that calls a method on response that creates the JSON for us. Then we're going to parse out the values that we want. So the first variable we're going to create is called Unix time. Remember, that's got the number of seconds since the first second of 1970. And the way we're going to get that is we'll refer to JSON, the object we created up here. And then in between brackets, we refer to the key name of the key value pair that we want to get the value of. So that's just going to be the string Unix time. This string here has got to be spelled exactly as it shows up in the returned JSON. And this is exactly how it's spelled on the web page where we took a look at our JSON. So this is good. And below this, we want to get the value associated with the raw underscore offset key. And we'll call this raw underscore offset, setting this equal to JSON and in between square brackets, the string raw underscore offset. Then I'll create the local time in seconds. I'm going to call this variable location underscore time, and I'll set it equal to Unix time plus raw offset. So I've just adjusted the Greenwich Mean Time for the correct hour in my time zone. And at least the first time I run this, I like to print out all of the results of the values I get. So I'm going to say print and then an F string. This is going to be Unix time colon in between Curly's Unix time, comma, raw underscore offset colon and in between Curly's raw underscore offset, comma, and location underscore time colon and in between Curly's location underscore time. Make sure you got your close double quote and your close parenthesis. This looks good. Then we're going to turn the seconds that we have in location underscore time into those different time components that I showed you on the prior slide. So we'll call the variable that holds the different components current underscore time, and we'll set that equal to time from the time library dot local time. And in between parentheses, we pass in the location time, the time in seconds. Then just so that we can see all those different components broken out, we'll say print and we'll pass in an F string, which is going to be current time colon. And in between curlies, it'll be current underscore time. Now all this will look pretty ugly, so why don't we go ahead and format and print the time and date in a more readable format. First we'll create a variable called printable underscore time, and we'll set that equal to the F string, so double quotes, double curlies, and I'll paste in current underscore time, but then I'll say dot TM underscore hour, so that gets the TM underscore hour property that's part of that multi-property value current time. And to format this, I'll just say colon D. That'll print it out as a value with no decimals. Then after the curly, I'm going to print a colon and then open and close curlies again. This is going to be current underscore time dot. This time it's TM underscore min. That'll give me the minutes value. And here I'll say colon zero two D. That'll make sure if I have a single digit minute that I preface that with a zero. And my font is so big, it's harder to see. So I'll shrink this down a little bit when I type the last component, which is going to be a colon after the curly and a new set of curlies. This is going to be current underscore time dot. And this will be the TM underscore sec, which is the seconds component. And I'll also say colon zero two D in here. That'll make sure that if I get a single second, I preface that with a zero. So I'll make this a little bigger, double check my work and it looks good. So I just formatted the time as a variable called printable time. So now we'll create a formatted date called printable underscore date. And we'll set that equal to F string, double quotes, double curlies. And I'll paste in current time and then say dot. And I want the TM underscore mun property. So that'll give me the month. Follow that with the colon D format. After the curlies this time, I'm going to add a slash and another set of curlies. This is going to be current underscore time dot TM underscore M day. So that gives me the date of the month colon D, then another slash and another set of curlies. And this will be current underscore time dot TM underscore year. And I'll set the formatter to colon zero two D. So that'll make sure if I have a single digit year that I have a zero in front of it. Then we'll print out these two values. So print F string between double quotes, printable underscore time colon and in between curlies, printable underscore time. Same thing down below for the date, print F string 
printable underscore date, colon in between curlies, printable underscore date. So we got a lot of print statements in here to check our work, but what we really want to do is update our real time clock. So we're going to set the RTC with the component time in current underscore time. We just say clock dot date time equals time, the time library dot struct underscore time. So we'll create a new time structure and set that to the current time by passing in current underscore time. That's it. Clock set. Then let's create a function called job. So we'll say def space job open and close parens colon. Make sure you've outdented this all the way. You don't want this function inside the other function. And we're going to call this when we schedule a job to run. So we'll say print a scheduled job just ran. And I also want to print out the time here. So we'll say printable time equals. And you know what? Why don't we copy this printable time equals line up here? And I'm going to paste it down below. But in the F string, every place where it says current underscore time, I'm going to replace that with clock dot date time. So we'll keep the same same properties in there, the TM hour, the TM min, and the TM sec, but just it refers to clock.datetime, so it gets the time from the clock. Then I'll copy this line up here that prints out the printable time. And now let's schedule a job so that it'll print this out. Ah, but before we do that, we should call get time once uh, first just to get the time from the internet. So we'll just call get underscore time, open and close parens here. Then let's schedule the jobs. So I want to run this job function every five seconds. So all I need to do is say schedule dot every in parentheses five dot seconds dot do in parentheses job. So every five seconds, it's going to call this job function. Then below this, I want to call get time once a day at midnight. So I'll say schedule dot every open and close parens dot day dot at in between parentheses double quotes zero zero colon zero zero so this is in military time and i enter it as a string this function turns that into time so that's great and then i'll follow this with dot do passing in the parentheses get underscore time so again every day at midnight it's going to run the get time function to get the latest time over the internet and update our real-time clock then i need to regularly check to see if i should run these processes so in my while true loop remember that's while capital t true colon Intended below this, I'll simply call schedule dot run underscore pending open and close parens. And now let's run this and see how things look. I'll open up my serial console, click on save. I've printed out the URL it's accessing. Let me make this bigger up oh, and we see all the times in seconds and we see the components of the time and we see our printable time and our printable date. Nice. And look at that. A scheduled job has run. We get the printable time and it's just about five seconds after the first time we printed our printable time. Five seconds later. We see a scheduled job is run, and that's five seconds after the last time we printed this. So this is looking good. What about this second job that we have up here, where we call get time every day at midnight? Well, why don't we change that time? My last time down here is 1440, so I'll change the time that get time runs to 1441. I'll save this and run again. And I might have to speed this up a little bit for you, but I can see every five seconds I'm still running the job function. It's saying a scheduled job has just run. We see that a few times, but then what's going to happen when we hit 1441? Oh! We run get time. We're printing out all the stuff that's inside the get time function. But we also see five seconds after the last time the job function ran, it runs again. Good work, Pythonista! I'll close the console and head over and save this to my CircuitPython school folder as Internet Time RTC Schedule Jobs Pico W. I'll open the code back up on my CircuitPy volume, and you should bask in the glory of that magnificent big learning you just accomplished. We learned to parse JSON, to convert universal time to our time zone using an offset, to convert time into components, to format time and date for readability, to create and set the Pico W's real-time clock, to schedule jobs, and to run scheduled jobs at preset times and intervals. You now have time talent equal to Morris Day, and you can work a clock better than Flavor Flav. So use those superpowers to go and make something awesome.